Hello, everyone, and welcome to RBCM at Home. My name is Kim Goff, and I'm a learning program developer at the Royal BC Museum. I'm coming to you today from my home, which is located on the traditional territories of the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations, the Lekwungen speaking peoples. RBCM at Home started in March when our museum and archive closed due to the pandemic. It was an opportunity to talk to staff about what they were working on from home. Now that some of us are back at the museum, this is an opportunity to continue to talk to folks from around the museum and to reach out to those of you at home or at school around BC. Today, I'm joined by the Royal BC Museum Curator Emerita, Dr. Catherine Bridge. Catherine retired in 2017 after a long and varied career at the BC Archives and the Royal BC Museum. She has led on the development of exhibitions, written publications, and of course, conducted research. Her knowledge of the art and life of Emily Carr is of special note, demonstrated in her work as curator of several popular Carr exhibitions and three museum published books, as well as an introductory essay for Carr's Cleewick. Most re recently, she has co-curated our feature exhibition, Emily Carr, Fresh Seeing, French Modernism and the West Coast, which is on now until January 24th. Hello, Catherine, and welcome back to RBCM at Home. Hello, Kim. Lovely to be here again. Yeah, last month you shared some stories from your research trip to France, where you followed in the footsteps of Emily Carr. Mm -hmm. I recently walked through the exhibit and I really enjoyed spotting some of those photographs of the paintings you took of mm -hmm. those places in France today um, as they were scattered throughout the exhibit. But the, the other thing I enjoyed, uh, which was surprising for me, were the archival materials in the exhibit. I expected to see the paintings. But there's a lovely um, smattering, if you will, of archival materials that are around uh, the exhibit as well that tell us a little bit more about the um, story of Emily Carr. And I think you're going to share some of those histories of those materials that are in the exhibit now. <laughs> yes, I will. Smattering is an excellent word. <laughs> Did, were there some, maybe before we, I start your presentation, were there some obvious choices to you where you just knew are you, this was going to go in and you would find a place for it no matter what? Or did you wait for the paintings hmm. and all of that to be selected first? No, there was some things that I knew I wanted to show right away. Um, but then there were a lot of things that I had yet to discover that have ended up in the exhibition as well. So, yeah. So should we put the first slide on and go Let's from there? Let's begin. Nice green. There we go. Here we are. <laughs> so this is to set the mood. This is um, Paris in about 1910, about the time that Emily Carr and her sister Alice visited. So it's a little bit of a, a visual cue for the way the city was at the time. Now, um, in curating this exhibit, uh, one of my intentions was to bring new knowledge forward and to be able to use the collections of the BC Archives and the Royal BC Museum in this exhibit, uh, in addition to having it an, an art um, exhibit. So uh, I didn't want to just rely on the same old information that was out there. Uh, what I wanted to do was to to mine the archives and, and to do some digging and to do it for 2020. Um, it's important to remember that the two biographical studies of Emily Carr were written in the 1970s. They were written at a time where, I mean, it was absolutely pivotal information um, and foundational now, but they were written pre-internet. So there's so much more research that can be accomplished from home uh, at institutions worldwide using the internet. So that was a really important strategy for doing the research. But um, first of all, I had to see exactly what existed in our collections already. And if any of you have a copy of Emily Carr's Growing Pains, which is the biography that was published, or sorry, the autobiography that she published, arranged to have published after her death, it's um, over 200 pages, and I think there's less than 10 pages about her time in France. Very little information in there. And what information is in there it has often been conflated uh, for good storytelling. So starting with that was um, 
it wasn't as helpful as I was hoping. So uh, what I'll do is take you through a little bit of the research process and also show you some of the documents that are in the exhibition and um, a couple of other photos. So let's go to the next slide. So um, it's important to see what others have done in the past. And so luckily we have a, a collection of materials about Emily Carr created by people who knew her. Um, and so what I did is, is I started in to see what other people had written about this time in France. And one of the collections we hold is the Flora Hamilton Burns material. Um, Flora Hamilton Burns was one of Carr's uh, listening ladies. And after Carr's death, she wrote um, a short biography of Carr and did some digging and sent letters everywhere, um, as people did in, in the, the 60s and 70s. Um, so this is a letter that just gives you a sense. I you know, don't expect you to read it all, but basically she's looking for information on the time in France. And she gets a little bit, which is a snippet of information for me. So I started with, with her. I started with uh, scholars like Doris Shadbolt uh, in different collections. And I wanted to see what was out there that hadn't been used before. Next slide. I also went through the Emily Carr archives that we hold. Um, we hold the largest, we as in the Royal BC Museum and BC Archives holds the largest archival material uh, relating to Carr, Carr's own records and records that other people have kept about Emily Carr or records that have come from Carr to them. So I started going through the records, um, not relying on citations in, in published works, but actually going back and looking to see was looking for snippets that had been lost or or not noticed before. So this is an obvious sort of thing. This is in her sister Lizzie's diary. And uh, she records that Alice Carr returned home from France after an absence of a little over a year. And then uh, a few months later, the fact that Emily Carr returned to Victoria from France on the 17th of November. So Assuming that she's accurate at the time she's writing this, that these are good notes and, and dates to have. And so it's this kind of little bits and pieces that formed, uh, that enabled me to start a chronology of the 16 months that Emily Carr was in France. Next slide. And of course, uh, the treasures in the archives, um, car material include various drafts for the stories that she wrote that were subsequently published. So this is the kind of draft uh, sample so that you can see the way that Carr has shaped and uh, edited her text. And so what I was looking for were earlier drafts that were perhaps longer and then edited down for the publications. I was looking for those little bits of missing details. And uh, it didn't find a whole lot, but again, just little tiny threads of information. Next Kevin, slide. Just confirming, is that Emily Carr's handwriting that we see on the typed? Some of it is and some of it isn't. Some of it is Carr's and some of it is her listening ladies uh, who were um, a small group of, of women who kind of critiqued and, and, and read some of her stories. The part in at the top, in red is Carr's handwriting. So yeah, there, there are probably three or four different versions of this particular chapter uh, in the archival records and they all are slightly different. So you kind of read them a little bit at a time and, and, and try and, and see what's missing that's helpful. Next. So included in the archival records are um, a large series of correspondence to Carr. These are letters coming in from other people. We know that over her lifetime, she recorded burning <laughs> because she you know, was clearing out moving house and decided there were a lot of things from her past that, <laughs> excuse me, she didn't want to carry forward. So we know she burnt a lot of her correspondence and her written records, but some of them have survived either because she missed them at the burning or they were important for her to keep. So 
what I was trying to do is, is to find the records around the time she went to France and, and see if she was interacting with people about the trip and making comments. So this is the first page of a letter that has come to her. She wrote to um, Algernon Talmadge, uh, one of her uh, most favorite uh, art instructors in England and asked him for advice about closing up her studio before she went to France. And he wrote back. Um, and and so, so now we know that she's planning to go to France and she's planning based on the information in, in the letter, she's planning in the early, early um, months of 20, of not, sorry, I get there, <laughs> uh, is the, of um, 1910. Next slide, please. And again, this is another letter from uh, 1910. Uh, Carr left, Carr and Alice left for France in the early summer. Uh, well, actually they left in, in July. And so this is a letter that obviously missed her. Uh, it was probably sent forwarded from her um, home in Victoria to uh, some kind of an address in Paris, but it's from one of her friends uh, that she kept in touch with from art school in England. And you can see the lovely little uh, nickname, uh, my dear little Carlite. So uh, her friends in England from those early years called her Carlite or Motor. <laughs> and uh, I think it's charming that she, she kept a letter like this and she kept several letters from this time period from this particular friend. And uh, the clues in the letter are things like, you know, when you come, and stay with us before you go to France. I only have one bedroom. <laughs> Sorry, your sister, I'll have to find another place, that sort of thing. So it's, um, it, it speaks to how much preparation that Carr took uh, before her, her trip. Next slide, please. And then also in the collection are a series of books um, that were from Emily Carr's library that she either re-gifted to other people or uh, she kept and in a trunk and it formed part of her estate. And I was really happy to find this book because of course it's got her signature and her address in Paris. So one can assume given the publication date of the book and the Paris address, this is something she purchased in Paris. And it's, it's a theory of pure design. She's uh, annotated it and, and um, underlined. So she's read it and so it, what it does is it tells us she wasn't just practicing art, she was intellectually understanding uh, the modern art movement while she was there. So it's, it's, you know, these are little bits really important. And so now we get into the, the actual records that exist from Carr's time in, in France. And this may be one reason why people really haven't written too much about her time in France because there's very little firsthand records. But there is a lovely assemblage of postcards that were written by both Emily and Alice while they were in Europe. And they're ones that were written home to their sisters in, in Victoria. And they provide information, uh, which uh, again allows us a chronology of what Carr was doing. And one of the things that the two sisters did is get out of Dodge uh, they found, Emily found that Paris was not good for her health. And so she and Alice went on a trip to Sweden and they sent postcards along the way. So based on the contents of the postcard and the information about when it was posted and all of that, we can get this very firm um, chronology of how long she was away and what they did. Next. And here's another one just to give you uh, an idea. It's always fun um, learning to read other people's handwritings. And <laughs> I found that Alice's is much easier than Emily's. <laughs> Next slide. So this is an example of Alice's handwriting. And this is another little gem from the collection. And it was originally um, cataloged as Emily Carr's expenses from Paris to Victoria, but based on the handwriting and based on uh, another document, we now know that this is Alice's expenses when she returned um, prior to 
to her sister Emily. So it gives you a sense of how much things cost at the time and the route that she took and the things that she thought were important to spend money on on the way back. I mean, they uh, she spent four nights in London upon her return, staying at Emily's old landlady, Mrs. Dodds. And she forwarded a trunk. She had to pay for excess baggage from France to, to London. So these are, um, again, clues. And is the excess baggage, is it paintings that Emily shipped with Alice? Is it souvenirs that Alice bought? <laughs> we don't know. Um, but what it does do is it, again, provides us a bit of a link. And now I know Alice's roots, so I can go on to uh, the various sources on the internet to find the ships that she took across the Atlantic. Um, and know exactly what dates she went from point A to point B and really confirm her, her trajectory. Now, I don't, I don't see a parrot listed on that list. Just wait, it's the oh. next slide. <laughs> oh, is it? Oh, no. <laughs> this, yeah. <laughs> so that was Alice's expenses. Now, this is the page in the middle of a small notebook that's got all sorts of stuff in it. But this is Emily Carr's handwriting, and is, it is quite difficult to read. Uh, it's, I don't know what was happening with the nib on her pen, but I think what she was doing is she was um, itemizing the things that she was bringing back to Canada for the customs and duty that would be applicable. Mm. So it's, uh, this is from her, her expenses. I mean, she bought corsets and stockings and a petticoat and hats and gloves and umbrella boots and, you know, all the things that you need. And she's added that up on the left-hand side. And then on the right hand side, it, um, it's the things that weren't her personal clothing and, and often, often they were gifts. So there's a harness for Billy, her dog, there's a brass jug and there's one parrot, uh, a French flag and uh, all of her um, painting supplies and you know, padlocks and <laughs> suitcases, all of that kind of thing. And uh, so it gives us a sense, is this excess, baggage or is this you know did she have to pay extra for that or did she bring it so it's it's interesting to know that um you know she had a certain amount of discretionary funds available to her i know she saved up her money from teaching art so she could go to uh france and she was on a on a tight um budget but she did you know have the discretion to be able to to spend so, and she's buying gifts. She's buying a collar for Deed, that's her sister, her, her, her dog. She's buying um, a dress for the, uh, the daughter of the woman who took care of her dog while she was away, all of that sort of thing. So it's just, it's nice little intimate details that tells us a little bit more about the person as opposed to the artist. Okay, next. So again, continuing with the postcards, which really, really are important for, um, there's probably, I think 12 postcards altogether. Uh, most of them are not in France. Most of them are this trip that Alice and she took through uh, parts of Europe. But the ones that are in France, uh, again, help us to learn exactly where she was. We know from her own writing that she went uh, from France or sorry, from Paris to Cressyon Brie. And then she went to Brittany and she stayed at two small towns in Brittany, one called uh, Santa Flamme and the other Concarneau. So here's a postcard from um, uh, Santa Flamme. It's in the environment of this, this larger town called, um, my, my French is terrible, Plessin le Gave. And this is a church. Um, and when you go to France today, it's all overgrown, but you can still find the church. So we know that, you know, Carr was right here. Next slide, please. And some of the archival research you do is spurred on at the time by what you see in the environment when you're there. So walking in France, uh, discovering an old abandoned, a uh, railway track right above the, where the hotel was that she stayed at, at um, Santa Flamme, and then taking a picture of the sign, and then going from there onto the internet to find out uh, about the historical network of roadways in France. And roadways, there weren't many, but railroads, there were many. And 
really, you know, it's kind of the moment, I don't know, the, the light bulb goes off. Of course, she traveled by train from place to place in France. So what did she carry with her? Um, how much could one woman carry uh, comfortably? And, and how, how far could she walk carrying everything? So these are the parts of the details that help us understand how Carr negotiated in France. Next slide. And here's yet another church. Um, she sent pictures of church back, churches back to her sisters who were quite religious. I think she thought she was getting brownie points by doing so. But what's helpful here is that then you can go and you can see these places and, and know um, that, that the car was there and she was sketching. Uh, this particular uh, card talks about her, um, about the weather in, in Brittany and she's sketching in the churchyard and, and she's doing it if you look at the postmarks in, in July. Um, so yeah, that fits right in with uh, the chronology of her time. Next card. Now there's only one letter that exists. Um, I'm hoping that at some point another one will reveal itself that was written by Carr while she was in France. So there are these postcards, but there is this one letter and this is not in the BC archives collection. It's actually in the city of Victoria archives um, and it's in the Cridge family uh, collection and because it was written to her friend, Nellie Cridge. And it is a, a six page letter that she wrote uh, from Brittany in July, and it's filled with details about uh, how she loves the countryside, how she enjoys the peasants, um, about what she eats at lunch, her routine every day of walking up behind the hotel and finding a spot and uh, sketching for the day and lying on the moss, uh, looking up at the sky and, you know, thinking thoughts. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's really nice to be able to get at the personal and really feel that you're understanding Emily Carr in the moment. Um, not when she's writing her book uh, about being in France when she's an older uh, elderly lady. This is, this is written right at the time. And these kinds of records are, are really, really important. And I I'm so glad we at least have one from her time in France. Uh, so anyone out there who has any Emily, Emily Carr correspondence, please do let me know. <laughs> Next slide, please. So one of the important things Carr did in France, uh, she exhibited, well, she, uh, she sent three paintings uh, for consideration by the jury for the 1911 Salon d'Autant. Uh, annual exhibition. And this was an annual exhibition. It was very huge. Uh, there were hundreds and hundreds of um, artists and artworks and all media represented. And it was um, something that was inaugurated in 1903. And it still goes today. Uh, when I was in, in Paris, I went to the Salon d'Autant and, and it had a, you know, a, a very uh, different kind of experience. So we know that she exhibited uh, we know that there's at least one painting and it's in the exhibit that was selected by the jury for inclusion in this show. Um, the original label still on the back, so all the documentation is there. The other painting um, is not confirmed, but we're pretty sure that uh, a painting called Autumn in France that was uh, that is in the collection of the National uh, Gallery of Canada is the second painting. So again, like, what did it look like? What did this exhibit look like? So you go to the internet, you go to the archives of the Salon d'Autant in, in Paris, and you do all these creative searches, can't find any images of the 1911 show. But this is 1912. So it's more Cubist. Uh, there were Cubists, uh, Picasso, and, and people like that in the 1911 show, but this is the 1912 show. It, it's close enough to give you a sense of the scale of some of these paintings and the fact that, you know, sculpture and, and artworks are, are integrated. So um, this may have been, you know, a, a similar kind of setting because uh, it was in the same place every year for uh, about 75 years. Um, this is maybe what it looked like. Next slide, please. 
before we switch slides, I'm, yeah. I'm just thinking how in 19, like to me now, this looks modern and new. And yeah. I'm just thinking to be in 1911 and to see something like this, it must have been such a change from well, what people were accustomed to. Absolutely. I mean, Carr went to France because she wanted to become a modern artist. She wanted to shed the trappings of 19th century representational art. So she didn't really know, you know, what it was all about, but she was so excited to be accepted um, by a jury in Paris <laughs> to have two mm -hmm. paintings selected was very, very prestigious. There were only two other Canadians in this show. And uh, yeah, so it, uh, it must have been extremely exciting for Carr and affirming that her work was, was accepted uh, in, in France. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there are a little more snippets of information in the archival collection. And this, um, you know, I kind of looked at it, you know, decades ago and hadn't really spent much time thinking about it. And I had a, a half remembrance that it was there. So of course you go into the collection and, and there uh, are miscellaneous files and you go through the miscellaneous files. And this on the left is, um, the front page of a, a little sort of, I guess, four-sided, uh, two pieces of paper, four, four sides of the instructions of how to apply to the Salon d'Automne. And on the right-hand side, not in Carr's handwriting, are some of the pertinent uh, sections translated into English with someone's signature or initials below, and I haven't figured out who that is. So um, when you go through the instructions, it's very clear that artists themselves have to submit and that they have to, um, you know, they have certain deadlines to meet and all of that kind of thing. And on this um, instruction sheet on the left, you can see a hand, uh, like a, a stamp on the top right. And it, the stamp is for an art supply shop in Paris, uh, R. Charbot. And, when you actually go to the catalog of the 1912 exhibition and you take a look at Carr's entry, um, it says, you know, Emily Carr, Canadian, and gives the titles, and all of the artists have to have an address. And her address is care of R. Charbot, which is really interesting because what it does is it tells us that Carr was still in Brittany and somehow she got her two or three Brittany paintings from Brittany by train to Paris, care of R. Charbot, who then with all the documentation and the, uh, the fee for entry, um, physically took her material to uh, the jury. So it's, um, it's, it's great to, to have this documentation. And it's really interesting to know that, you know, I mean, because Carr didn't speak French, and Alice was already at home, she had to have someone that she felt comfortable with that, that would be willing to help her translate this. And so there's another English speaking person and it's not her art teacher, but I'm not sure who it is uh, that helped her out with this. So again, this is car and relationships, friendships um, and the networking uh, that helped her exist in France and to to be able to offer paintings uh, for consideration for the show. Next slide. So one of the cool things um, I was hoping to find and I didn't. Uh, the second location in France was, um, sorry, in, in Brittany was to study under New Zealand artist Frances Hodgkins. When you read her growing pains, She's got one paragraph at the end of the chapter on France and says, and then I moved to Concarneau to study under an Australian painter whose name I've forgotten. Um, Frances Hodgkins was a New Zealander, not Australian, um, and she worked in watercolor. And she was almost the exact same age as Carr. And she was living out of her home country, uh, making a living. Uh, teaching art and she lived in France for for several decades and I thought oh my goodness you know there, there's got to be some records from Frances Hodgkins there's a huge big book with all of her 
annotated correspondence from her entire life. And you go to the book and there's six months where she didn't write any letters or no letters have survived. So no, there's no documentation. So then you start thinking, well, you know, who do we know that also um, received art lessons from uh, Francis Hodgkins in Concarneau? And it's possible to read in the, the letters before and after the time car was there for glimpses of these names. So then you start Googling these names and, and uh, you end up with tape recordings of uh, elderly women in New Zealand recording their time being with Francis Hodgkins, no reference to Carr at all, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's an exciting area for more digging. I guess the only records are the paintings, perhaps, that <laughs> Emily made with, when she was with exactly. her. Exactly, and uh, if you are at the exhibit, you will see three watercolor paintings of um, sailing vessels, just like the one that uh, Francis Hodgkins is standing in front of painting. So you can really get a sense of, because uh, Hodgkins had very small classes, like three, four people. And they, um, they didn't always all paint together, but at times they did, I'm sure. So whether Carr's paintings were done, you know, at the same time as this photograph, I don't know. Okay, next. So this is, again, this is Concarneau. And when you uh, take a look at the, the letters that Frances Hodgkins has left, uh, she writes that she's living in the, this hotel. And this photograph is from one of her other students taken the same summer. So Carr writes about being staying in a hotel that had a big um, plaza in front of it and a well. And it certainly looks to me as though this is a big plaza and a well in front of this uh, hotel. So one would think that, you know, Carr probably stayed at the same place. Next slide. This is the same hotel. It's, it's, it looks a little different. It's in the same spot. It's got the same name as, you know, it had some additions to it. And there is a plaza in front of it. There's no well, but there's a big parking place, a big parking lot. So uh, being able to you know, look at historical photographs and then uh, be prepared for being on the spot is, is really important in doing research. Next slide, almost at the end. So these are uh, just some images of the old medieval walled city of Concarneau. Um, the image on the top left if you, you can see some orange um, awnings, um, those are awnings in front of this same hotel. Uh, no, they're top, top left, right there. <laughs> there you go. So if Carr was staying at this hotel and not wanting to walk very far with all of her uh, things, um, my guess was that she went to the, the walled town, which is on this peninsula. And as it turned out, I was correct. And a lot of the paintings that we discovered the locations of are actually in this, um, this old walled town. Next slide. And again, there was a lot of archival research and internet searching that happened while I was on the ground and picking up pamphlets um, and going to local museums and talking to people uh, about uh, the past of their town. And uh, the left-hand side here shows uh, one of the outlying little hamlets from uh, Concarneau that has the railway line on it. So today you can get in your car and uh, trace the railway line and you can walk part of it because it's all a linear trail. And uh, there's a church shown, my car likes churches. So you get out and, and this is what the church looked like about a hundred years ago and see these kind of little lollipop trees. Next slide. Um, this is a painting on the right that she did with the same lollipop trees. The painting, uh, the photograph on the left is a, a photograph of some of the overgrown lollipop trees uh, looking in the same direction um, in 2018. So it's because of understanding how she moved around in France that you're able then to, to take, do guesswork and a lot of uh, um, trial and error 
searching, but able to, to find the places that, that Carr painted. And he couldn't do it without a foundation of the archival records and a huge curiosity uh, to go down rabbit holes on the internet. And I think that's the end of my presentation. Thank you, Catherine. Wow, there's a couple um, couple comments that I missed during the, the presentation. Um, one person was asking if the presentation would be available afterwards. We have recorded this and it will be on um, the Royal BC Museum's YouTube channel. So you can look for this one and Catherine's previous talk um, there. So you will find them. Um, Lori was wondering when you saw those lovely lists that Alice had made of all their expenses, would those be in dollars or, or French francs? I think those were in Canadian dollars. So, yeah. Um, so. Yeah. so I, I noticed the parrot was 80. That's quite yeah. a lot, considering her suit was 100. Well, that's a, that's it was one a, of the second most expensive thing on her list. It, exactly. <laughs> so you, you, <laughs> you had to be <laughs> really desperate to buy an African gray. <laughs> All right. And it's the first thing she bought when they, she landed in Liverpool at Cross's huge bird market there. It was world famous. So yeah, it, impulse buy. <laughs> it tells you one of the things, uh, I, I guess I was wondering as I was looking at this, if if you visited the exhibit and you only looked at her paintings, what would you miss about Carr's story if you didn't look at this archival material? And something like that list showing, you know, she was spending eighty dollars uh, on a on a parrot tells you what she was valued and what was important to her as well. Mm -hmm. What are some? If you have any, um, you've looked at so many of her documents and handwritings. Are there particular insights you have into her personality? Oh well. I know she was a very determined woman and she was uh, quite fearless in many respects. Um, she, she had difficulties in big cities and yet she still went to big cities in order to further her art education. Um, she got desperately homesick. Um, she was close to her family despite all sorts of you know, disagreements over time. Um, she was really grounded in Victoria and I and friendships, lifelong friendships. Some of these uh, letters, you know, they're kind of random letters that have lasted through time. And, you know, if she kept a letter from 1910 and she died in 1945, I mean, it, she kept it because it represented something important to her. And I think it's the connections that Carr made during her lifetime that are really important. And the archival material in the exhibit provides us with little glimpses. Yeah, beautiful. Um, from uh, Louise on Facebook saying thank you, that was awesome. Uh, mm -hmm. Stacy yeah. in Kelowna is asking um, that you mentioned she had to pay an entrance fee to be in the exhibit, the salon. Would mm -hmm. she have won something or did she win anything? No, she didn't win anything. Um, she paid her entrance fee um, as hundreds of artists did and uh, the prestige of being shown. I think that was the, the reward. Right, very good. Well, thank you, Catherine, again for, for joining us and uh, coming back to share with us again uh, after last month. Uh, we hope folks enjoyed the program. If you did, we, we hope you consider either making a donation to the museum or becoming a member where you get uh, lots of benefits. And want to let you know that we are reopened uh, and we are ready to welcome you back. You can find out more on our website. We will be continuing with At Home, At Home Kids, and At Outside for the foreseeable future. And all of those links uh, and programs, again, are on our website. Next week, I'll be speaking with History Collection Manager, Paul Ferguson. And we'll be going on a virtual tour to Belgium and France to visit Canadian war memorials and historic sites found there. So I hope you will join us. And until then, take care of yourselves and one another. Bye-bye. Yeah.